Club Club, the weekly video webcast from New Hampshire Watchdog and the Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy. I'm your host, Grant Bossy. This week in the cloakroom, we peel back the curtain on state government spending with the Josiah Bartlett Center's new online database at nhopengov.org. We sit down with Senate Ways and Means Committee Chairman Bob O'Dell to discuss how one town is struggling to rebuild after the State Board of Education shut down its school. And we bring you the results of our New Hampshire watchdog poll on whether or not New Hampshire should pull out of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. We start with transparency. For the past two years, the Josiah Bartlett Center has been compiling every check that the state of New Hampshire writes. This week, they unveiled nhopengov.org at a press conference in Concord. Thank everybody for coming. Uh, I'm Charlie Arlinghouse from the Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy. And um, today we're launching uh, a website that we think is very exciting and two years in the making. It's essentially uh, a, a tool for state government to track state spending. For, for decades, there's a growing movement in this country for greater transparency in state government. Essentially, your government checkbook and your personal checkbook should be equally accessible. You should know every dollar the government spends. You should be able to track every dollar the government spends. We're in a position um, in this day and age where we can do that. Technology has given us the ability to do that. For years, uh, we had access to broad data on government spending. We didn't have access to detailed data on government spending. Uh, so at the Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy, we decided to create NewHampshireOpenGov.org. NewHampshireOpenGov.org is meant to be a portal, an online, searchable, gatekeeper-free explanation of every dollar the state spends money on. Essentially, you can look at everything we spend money on from a $4 car wash to hundreds of millions of dollars in grants. And uh, the idea is to put all of that information uh, regularly and updated online in a format where if you want to, you can search for state spending in your pajamas. Uh, you can search at home, you can search at work, you can search anywhere. And you don't have to go to a, uh, one location where there's one giant book that's deposited. A hundred years ago, there would be a general ledger. You would have to go open and, and flow, flow through the pages of a ledger. Well, today, you don't have to do that. Today, today we should be able to um, we should be able to find anything at our fingertips, and we're creating that. Um, some, this is a movement that started around the country. The federal government is going to do this. Um, it's actually going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars doing this federally. But at the state level, uh, we've started gathering. In, a, in an individual year, the state of New Hampshire has about a million transactions of data. There are about a million uh, checks we write, or the equivalent of a check we write. Um, and the idea is for each of those checks to be put into a database and to be completely searchable so that everything we spend money on is easily accessible to every citizen that we spend money on behalf of. So we're very excited about this. We think that um, we're launching it with about a half a million lines of data, I think 463,000 different individual transactions in a searchable database. I'm going to actually hold this up for you and I'll, and I'll show it to anybody afterwards, but it's a website. You can go there now if you want, um, nhopengov.org. And this is, <clears throat> there's, no, there's no gatekeeper, anybody can go, we don't have to know who you are, what you are. You can, uh, you can love state spending, you can hate state spending, whatever, but you can search for data. You go there, you look at it, the chart comes up, you can search by vendor, you can search by name, you can search by anything you want. If you wanted to, you could. In fact, I'm going to do this now for you. You, you can go down to a, to a search function, you type in the word, let's say, car wash. People forget the state spends money on car washes, and cars are um, And you can search for that data. And for example, I type in the word car wash, I get 436 records that show up. And the state spent in 2009 $11,000 on car washes. But I don't just know that. I don't just know that we spent $11,000 on car washes. I know every single instance. We spent $4 on Uno's car wash on, on uh, June the 11th. We spent $5 at the Goro car wash on, uh, on April the 6th. Um, I know every detail of every every piece of spending we have. Why are we spending money at a pet crematorium? We can figure that out. We don't just know broadly speaking what people are doing. We know down to the down to the dollar every single thing state government does. Um, this has been two years in the making. This is the this is the process of a right to know request. This is the outcome of a right to know request that began 
um, in April of 2009. And we're at the point now where we're putting spending in line. Uh, we're also on the cusp of a movement toward transparency in the state right now, where um, the Bates bill passed the House this week, which is which will require state departments to make this uh, information easily accessible on a monthly basis. The executive council at their meeting yesterday um, is talking about uh, making this information widely available. We had a meeting with the Commissioner of Administrative Services where we agreed on a cooperative basis to actually move forward our request and start dealing with um, the information uh, so that their interaction with the Executive Council can actually um, be through an independent, easily accessible portal. So um, our goal is to put every dime the state spends online. And we're very excited about this analytical tool that we've built for anyone to use. We continue now in the cloakroom with Senator Bob O'Dell. He's from the Claremont region, Lemster, I believe. I live in Lemster, but I represent yeah. Claremont and 20 towns in Cheshire, Sullivan, and Merrimack counties. So District 6 over in the western half of the state, kind of the, the part between Hanover and Keene. Uh, and we're going to talk about one of those towns you represent, Unity, specifically the Unity School. Uh, you've got a bill, Senate Bill 24, which would exempt the, new, the school uh, reconstruction in Unity uh, from the moratorium and put them into the building aid program. Why, uh, why a special case for unity? Well, it's a special case, Grant, because the state school board voted on the 8th of July to close the unity school. And when they did that, they basically told them, you have to find an alternative way to educate the children, a place to educate the children in unity. And um, the other option was to meet some immediate repairs and uh, but that was not going to be enough because long term they did not consider the Unity School physical building uh, adequate for an education for children. And so uh, with their backs against the wall, the people of Unity, uh, after a lot of debate and discussion, went to the Superior Court and the Superior Court said they could have a revote on a prior vote when they turned down a bond. And they went uh, in August and had a, the court agreed with that. They went ahead in August and they had a special vote and they voted overwhelmingly. While two prior votes had not um, been successful, they voted overwhelmingly, four to one, to go ahead with a new building. The new building was cheaper than uh, just reconstruction. It kept the kids for the year in the old school, and they'll build the new school next to it. And they did this knowing that the possibility existed that they would not get school building aid. Let me put this in perspective. School building aid started in New Hampshire in 1955. This is the only school building project that would be rejected for, the need, for their needs. In other words, the only school ever not to get the school building aid. And the second part of that is that it wasn't their choice. The state closed the school eight days after the current moratorium went into effect on July 1 of 2010. So this is an issue, A, of fairness. The other part is that they were told by the Department of Education that they would qualify for school building aid because it answered a need relative to safety and security for the children and the people working in that school. Um, however, then the Attorney General looked at the bill that was passed last year that created the moratorium and said, no, Unity does not qualify. Now, there's, there's an exemption for emergencies, your roof collapses, you could, you could still get into the building aid past the moratorium, but because Unity was a complete new school, it wasn't just fixing the emergency situation, it didn't qualify? That is correct. Okay. And, of course, this is a real blow because that would pay for 45 percent of the school building. And, again, uh, we've done this for 55 years. The Town of Unity has participated in the taxes and fees that are used to pay for school building aid, and so it only seems fair that they would be included in the program. Uh, this is not something where the people of Unity did anything wrong. They're responding to uh, the state school board. I think the leadership in the town uh, struggled to get this accomplished. Uh, the people turned out. They had the meeting in Claremont because there's no place to hold it in Unity and voted overwhelmingly for this new school, which they took. Um, over two million dollars of the original proposal to make it down to less than five million dollars. Um, the bill, the Senate Bill 24, is that still on the table or is the Senate acted on it? The Senate Bill 24 is on the Senate table uh, where it will stay. Uh, the, vote, the vote has been already twice yeah. unanimous in the Education Committee first yeah. and secondly in the uh, Finance Committee, both of those committees. The, set, the, House, the um, Education Committee recommendation about to pass passed unanimously in the full Senate and then last week the bill was put on the table. And by prior agreement, uh, Senator Morse, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, will put the language of Senate Bill 24 
into the budget. So this can wait until the end yes. of June when the budget's going to go, but the Senate is going to put it into its version of the budget. Yes, and Governor Lynch put it in his version of Senate Bill, of House Bill 2, which is the companion bill to the budget bill. Moving from this, this unity exemption to the moratorium to the broader building aid program, do you see the legislature lifting the moratorium? Do you see uh, for future projects? And what do you think of the governor's plan to fund the program at about 40 percent in the first year of the biennium? I do not have any problems with funding it at a less amount, lesser amount than we've funded it in the past. But I will tell you that the uh, chink in the armor here is the fact that for three years we bonded school building aid. Here you go for a period of 1955, recessions, terrible economic times, to really good times, and in every case we paid for the annual school building aid out of operating costs. In other words, they were part of the budget every year, so there was no long-term commitment of the state other than pay our, our bills on a current basis. Um, when we bonded it, we, we did a terrible thing, in my opinion, was when we went ahead and bonded that. It, it, it distorted the program. Long term, school building aid needs to be targeted to the communities and the projects that have the greatest impact for the largest number of people and the communities that are in the greatest need. Uh, wealthy communities, as you know, uh, based upon property taxes and the cost of educating a student per dollar valuation in a community, uh, determine whether a community can raise money easily in terms of doing a capital project, a new school or a renovation, while it's uh, not so easy for property poor towns. And so we've got to address that issue. We cannot have just towns that have a, uh, um, a lot of money, let's face it, a lot of money to be taxed from a property tax standpoint, getting building aid in those communities that are really struggling, uh, where it's really tough to pass a bond, to not give them the opportunity to have that bond passed. So you'd like to see a, a fundamental reform of the building aid uh, formula before that moratorium is lifted, before new schools get put into the program? Yes, I don't mind going ahead with the governor's program short term. But longer term, we definitely need to address the issue of, um, you know, hugely elaborate, I'll call it, uh, some would say extravagant uh, spending on a particular school building while uh, other schools are being built just really basic structures just for instructional value. Uh, so we need to make a policy decision of where we want to be 10, 20, 30 years from now because, um, you know, when we're in a dire time like right now in terms of finances. This is not the time to build a fancy football stadium. Uh, this is not the time to build the most elaborate grounds around a school. This is a time we need to be worried about the instructional value of the buildings in which youngsters are being taught. The building aid program, a small piece of a, a huge $11 billion budget. Obviously the House goes first and you have to wait till the budget comes over to the Senate, but that doesn't mean you're not doing anything. How do you see the budget shaping up on the Senate side? I see the budget shaping up on the Senate side. Uh, we will take and value what the governor proposed. We will take and value what the House sends to us. Uh, and we will use the information that comes with that budget. I look at the Senate starting, in a sense, with a blank piece of paper. We have a process over here where, uh, as the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, sometime in early May, I'll make a recommendation through my committee. Uh, the committee members will vote on revenue estimates. Our revenue estimates might be the same as the governor proposed, might be the same as the House has proposed, but whatever they are, that's what the Senate budget will be. We will not spend more than we think will come in from revenues. Uh, and, and because this is early May, you're going to have those crucial months of March and April revenues to determine what it's going to look like going forward. We get a major um, bit of information from the returns of uh, a, uh, March and April, and so yes, that is a key building block for our discussions. I have a subcommittee of the group, of my, of my Ways and Means Committee. We've been meeting once or twice a week to try to frame the process by which we will come to an agreement within our committee uh, on the budget estimates. But um, yes, you'll see a very thoughtful process here in the Senate. And uh, we're, we're speaking to you on Wednesday, just minutes after the Senate approved along party lines, 19 to 5, Senate Bill 3, a series of reforms to the New Hampshire retirement system. Now goes to the Senate Finance. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, this retirement system package? I am very enthusiastic about it. Um, I don't want to talk in partisan terms, but the reality is that it was 19 Republicans that voted for it and five Democrats that voted against it. I wish it hadn't been along party lines. We're at a near crisis with the retirement plan. If we had not taken action today, uh, the Finance Committee taking action next week, and then we'll finally vote it out in, a, in two weeks, uh, I think that the state of New Hampshire would have jeopardized their entire um, retirement plan. 
50,000 people are members of the retirement plan, the average person's deficit is $94,000. That's how bad it is. That's, that equivalent equates to $4.7 billion. So this is in the interest of local taxpayers, property taxpayers, because the employers, the towns, the cities, um, school districts, uh, it's also uh, important to people who represent and work for towns and cities who, who have to deal with budgets. It's very important for people who are going to be hired in the future because those individuals uh, want to secure a place, they want to secure retirement. That is in jeopardy today unless we take the action similar to what we did today. For those people who are already hired, who are not vested, we're asking them to have a phased in increase in the amount of uh, contribution and we're also asking them to extend the number of years that they would be working before retirement. For those who have been vested, that is they've worked for the state or a local community for 10 years, they're going to be taken care of with, with virtually no impact from this. And retirees, there's no impact there. This retirement system, which is critical to the workforce of New Hampshire in terms of public employees, needs to be stabilized, it needs to be sustainable, and it needs to be something that meets the needs of employees as well as the people who pay the bill, that is employer employees as well as um, the taxpayers. Senator Bob Odell, thanks for joining us in the cloakroom. Thank you. Last week, we spoke with House Finance Committee Chairman Ken Weiler about a bill to pull New Hampshire out of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Our New Hampshire Watchdog poll asked you whether this was a good idea. So, you agree with the New Hampshire House that we should end New Hampshire's participation in Reggie at the end of the year. After the bill comes out of the Finance Committee, it'll head to the Senate and to a likely veto by Governor John Lynch. We'll keep track of that bill and the rest of New Hampshire state government right here in the cloakroom. For the Josiah Bartlett Center and New Hampshire Watchdog, I'm Brent Bossie. Thanks for watching.